Let's begin with prayer. Father God, I thank you for this day you've given us. I thank you for your Son, the Holy Spirit. I praise you that you never leave us nor forsake us. I ask now, Lord, that you would guide us as we look into your word, teach us your word, because we need your word. We need you, Lord. In this ever-changing culture, in the foundation that is always shifting, we thank you for the foundation of your word that is true and solid and sure. Lord, help us to stand on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, some predictions from the past 150 years. Popular mechanics in 1949 said computers in the future may weigh more, no more than 1.5 tons. Thomas Watson of IBM in 1943 said, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Maybe 500 billion. <laughs> The engineer at the Advanced Computer Systems Division of IBM in 1968 said, but what is it good for? He was asking about the microchip. Ken Olson, president, chairman, and founder of Digital Equipment Corps, said in 1977, there's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. A Western internal memo in 1876 said, this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. This de the device is inherently of no value to us. David Sarnoff's associates replied to him about an investment opportunity in the 1920s. The wireless music box has no imaginable commercial value. Who would pay for a message sent to nobody in particular? David Sarnoff was trying to get investors for the radio. Bill Gates in 1981 said 640K ought to be enough for anybody, referring to memory and RAM, I guess, or something like that. Gary Cooper said, I'm glad it'll be Clark Gable who's falling on his face and not Gary Cooper. He was talking about his decision not to take the leading role in Gone with the Wind. How'd that movie do anyway? Yeah. A cookie store is a bad idea. Besides, the market research report says America likes crispy cookies, not the soft and chewy cookies like you make, Mrs. Fields. <laughs> so we went to Atari and said, hey, we've got this amazing thing, even built with some of your parts, and what do you think about funding us or we'll give it to you? We just want you to do it. Pay our salary. We'll come to work for you. And they said, no. So then we went to Hewlett Packard, and they said, hey, we don't need you. You, have, you haven't even got through college yet. This is the story of Steve Jobs trying to get Atari and HP interested in his and Steve Wozniak's personal computer. Pierre Pachette, a professor of physiology at Toulouse in 1872, said, Louis Pasteur's theory of germs is a ridiculous fiction. And my personal favorite was said by Charles H. Duell in 1899. He was the commissioner of the U.S. Office of Patents. He said, everything that can be invented has been invented, 1899. As I read these quotes and these predictions, if you will, I am amazed at how many times we underestimate the power, the creative genius, and the innovative spirit of the human mind and intellect. And if we underestimate the power of man, can you imagine what we do with God? How we forever limit him and say no to him, where we simply say, that's just impossible. In Ephesians 3.20, we read, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, who is able to do immeasurably more than we could even ask or imagine. And if we cannot adequately and effectively predict what humanity will do in the future, how can we completely understand and appreciate what God has planned for you and his coming kingdom? If we cannot predict what the next big thing is, what makes you think we can predict God and what he has in store for you and me? For our God can do more than we can even imagine. Our God can move mountains, transform cities, heal the sick, raise the dead, and confirm within you his spirit his identity, and his plan. Our God is overwhelming and wonderful. And if we cannot predict the future, how can we deny our Lord's coming? Christ is coming again, and that is a settled fact. We know it's a settled fact because of the testimony of Scripture. Matthew G in Matthew, Jesus told the Sanhedrin, those who tried, to tried and convicted Jesus, unjustly said this you will see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven in john jesus said, promised his disciples in my father's house are many dwelling places if it were not so i would have told you for i go to prepare a place for you 
if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talked of the hope we have in Christ's future coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the, to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. He will hand the deed of the kingdom and say, it's done. Jesus has already accomplished this and continues to accomplish this. The end is coming, and he is coming. Later on in 1 Corinthians, we read, In a moment, in the twinkling of an, eye, of, of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. This is the coming of Christ, coming to collect you and me so that we may live with him. And then, as we read earlier in 1 Thessalonians, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. He is coming to gather us so we can live with him. What a promise. What a joy of a promise. That is the promise. Christ is coming. We wait for him. We expect him. And I challenge us to pray today and throughout our lives. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Let this be our prayer. This is our hope. Let it be our lifestyle. As followers of Christ, there's a way to live in expectation for the coming of Christ. We do not know when he will come, but he will come. The promise of scriptures are true. Christ is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. Follow him and you will know his promises. You'll rest in his promises. So we pray, come Lord Jesus. In the book of Acts, the Lord Jesus has risen from the dead. He's alive. He had died on the cross. He was brutally beaten. He was mocked and hated. Then he was nailed to the cross, humiliated. Jesus died. His body was removed, placed in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And a large stone was rolled in the front of it. Then on early Sunday morning, that stone was removed. The guards fell down. And Jesus walked out of that tomb completely, totally alive. And powerfully, victoriously, he arose. We live in a world where Jesus is risen from the dead. His disciples saw him. They even touched him. They saw him eat. He was truly alive. In Matthew 28, Jesus is in Galilee with his disciples on the mountain. He will give what he, we call the Great Commission. But before he said the Great Commission, it says this, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. Well, that would make sense they were doubtful because they just saw him die a brutal death. And when you see someone die a brutal death, you go, is this really him? He is, it was too fantastic. Dead men do not walk. What is impossible with man is possible with God. God does the impossible. What we find in Acts 1 through 11 is that Jesus demonstrated clearly he is alive. In verse 2 it says, Until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had been by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these he presented himself alive after his suffering, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And we see that Luke tells us plainly in verse 1, it says that, all he, that he wrote this letter for Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach. We see clearly Jesus was alive and he proved it over a period of 40 days. Very clearly. Christ proved himself with many convincing proofs, and the most convincing is that he was walking and talking with them. He hung out with his disciples for over a month. The Lord Jesus proved beyond a shadow of doubt he is alive. He is alive. Here was a man with a physical body, beating heart, who died, and he was dead for three days. He, was mo he wasn't mostly dead, as we find in the <laughs> Princess Bride. No, he wasn't mostly dead. He wasn't half dead or just recuperating in the grave. No, he w died, and then he arose. He proved truly that he is alive in every way. If Christ, who died and then arose, promises you that he will return, why would we not believe it if he conquered death? What would stop him? Whatever he says is legitimate and real. How can we doubt the one who did the impossible? What can stop God? 
from doing what he wants? Nothing. Who can stop God from doing what he wants? No one. Well, he is capable of whatever he says, so open his word, read it, find out the promises and the impossible things that you can do in God, and pray, come, Lord Jesus. So number one, the promised Holy Spirit. Let's look at verses four and five. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. As day 40 arrives and Jesus will ascend to the Father, Jesus had convinced rather strongly he is alive. But now it was time for him to return to the Father. He gathered the disciples and told them, wait until the Holy Spirit arrives because the work and ministry that was asked of them could not be done on their power. Don't say a word, don't lift a finger, don't move a muscle in ministry until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no mission, there is no church, there is no hope, there is no message. In John, the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, I will ask the Father and you and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides in you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. The Holy Spirit is the means by which the disciples will speak the message of the gospel and the power to live out that message. The Holy Spirit will live in the lives of Christ's disciples. In fact, his church The Holy Spirit will fill his church. We are not left out because Christ ascended to the Father, but instead we're renewed and blessed because of the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Spirit is the reality of Christ living his life in you and in me. A few chapters later in John, Jesus said to his disciples, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. away. For if I do not go away, The helper will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. In Acts 1, Jesus told his disciples, wait for the Holy Spirit. So number one, seek the presence of the Holy Spirit. Seek his presence. Seek the filling of the Holy Spirit. Seek the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Seek to walk in the Holy Spirit. When we think of the coming of Christ, let us live in the power of of the Holy Spirit. Let us rely on the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Let us rely on Him. He desires to fill you. He desires to empower you. Zechariah said, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God will accomplish what He wants in His church through the Holy Spirit. How are we to understand that awesome miracle, the resurrection, unless we're filled with the Holy Spirit. How can we make one step in the direction of God, do any kind of righteous work, or speak the words of the gospel without the Holy Spirit? The church cannot exist without the Holy Spirit. The words of God cannot be believed without the Holy Spirit. The confession that Christ is Lord cannot be uttered without the Holy Spirit. The eyes and ears of the defiant sinner cannot be opened without the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to wait. For when he comes, a transformation of heart is about to be unleashed. And we will cry out, come, Lord Jesus. When Jesus told his disciples to wait, he wanted them to be ready to preach the gospel and all extenuating circumstances that would come with it. All the attacks that would come, the persecution that would come. How can we endure the evil of this evil age unless we are filled with the Holy Spirit? And we will accomplish all that we need to accomplish because of him the minute they begin to preach the message of jesus the gospel message they face the enemy and his attacks his lies and his threats they had to have the holy spirit preparing them and helping them to stand on that solid ground because let me tell you when the threats come when the lies come when the hate comes you want to say i give up with the power of the holy spirit we say i endure I keep going, I keep preaching, I keep worshiping, 
I keep confessing. I keep declaring, come Lord Jesus. When the church is filled with the Holy Spirit, it can endure the onslaught of the enemy. Also, the power of the Holy Spirit, the hope of Christ's return brings peace. Christ is returning. The struggle we endure will not last. When we talk about the coming of Christ, it is to show that the evil does not get the final say. Death does not get the final say. Injustice will not endure. Sickness will not last. The devil only has a short time. Christ's return reminds us that the evil age has been put on notice, and Christ put it on notice. (laughs) Christ has said, evil will die. The Holy Spirit will empower the church to live the Christ life and and live in the expectation of Christ and Him coming again. With the Holy Spirit, we see the end of evil and the hope of God's gracious love fully known. This is why we pray and we cry out, Come, Lord Jesus. Number two, the promised mission. Let's take a look at verse six. So when they had come together, this is the 40th day. So when they came together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. In the early 1900s, 16-year-old William Whiting Borden graduated from the Hill School in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Ever heard of that, Wayne? Pottstown, Pennsylvania? All right, good. It's a prestigious boarding school, actually, known for sending its alumni to Princeton University. This is when most of those um, Ivy League schools were somewhat Christian, actually. Well, he was an heir to the Borden family mining fortune and had a clear path to wealth and success. He was all set before him to go to Princeton, inherit his wealth, continue on in his father's business. But before Borden began his Ivy League education, uh, actually, he didn't go to Princeton. He went to Yale. His parents sent him on a year-long trip around the world as a graduation present. Pretty nice, huh? Who wouldn't like that? Well, early in his life, Borden had come to Christ, and while traveling the world, something happened that no one expected, and I'm sure his father didn't want. He was moved by the spiritual and physical needs around the world, and he wrote his parents a letter and informed them that he wanted to spend his life as a missionary. Well, one of his friends remarked that becoming a missionary would be tantamount to throwing his life away, just throwing your life away. Well, upon his return from his uh, vacation that his father gave him, his parents, he went on to Yale and graduated. He studied and graduated from Princeton Theological Seminary. Again, like I said, this is when it was actually Christian. And when his ministry preparation was complete, he boarded a ship to Asia to serve among Muslims in China's Gansu province. And along the way, though, he stopped in Egypt uh, to learn Arabic and study Islam. Well, sadly, in Egypt, Borden contracted spinal meningitis, and less than a month later, he was dead. He was only 25 years old. Borden had walked away from his fortune to take the gospel of Jesus to the nations of the world. And most regarded his death as a tragedy. However, God took that tragedy and did something far greater than Borden could ever imagine. When young men and women read Borden's life and his commitment in newspapers and of America, it inspired them to leave everything and become missionaries and give their lives so they could preach the message of Jesus to the to the to the people around the world. It's rumored that at key points in his life, Borden wrote a series of phrases in his Bible while he struggled with his desire to become a missionary against his father's heavy disapproval. He wrote no reserves when his father disapproved of it. Toward the end of his time in Yale, where he started a Bible study attended by three-quarters of the school's student population, he wrote no retreats. And as he lay dying of spinal meningitis in Cairo, he wrote no regrets. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. <clears throat> the doctrine of Christ's second coming is uniquely tied to the mission of Christ. We preach the message to bring back Christ. We preach the message so all the world will have a chance to respond. We preach the message of Jesus because it's the power of God. It is the hope of humanity. And the salvation of our souls. 
So number one, complete the work of God. Finish it. Preach the message. Boldly proclaim it. Because what can they do to us? The CMA is focused on the work of God of bringing the gospel to all the world. Now, we're not the only ones, obviously, but certainly that is our desire, to bring the message of Jesus to as many homes throughout the world that we can. It's our desire. It's why we raise up missionaries. All of Jesus for all the world. When it began, A.B. Simpson began the work that we know as the Christian Missionary Alliance. He focused on sending missionaries around the world, and he said the gospel preaching was the primary task of the missionaries. Simpson said, mission is the Lord's own appointed of hastening, appointed way of hastening and speedy coming. At Simpson's funeral, Walter Turnbull said of Simpson, he is the only great teacher we know who linked the evangelization, evangelization of the world as a necessary preparation for Christ's return and with the study of prophecy. We are here to preach the message because we want everyone to have a chance to hear the message and respond. We can't control what people will do. But we can control and we can do what we can to make sure people hear it. You know, one time a New York Journal reporter approached A.B. Simpson with a question. He asked him, do you know when the Lord will return? And Simpson said, yes. And I will tell you if you promise to print just what I say with reference and all. And the reporter poised a notebook and pencil in hand, gave the ready promise, saying, I'll write everything you say. Then put, down, then put this down, he says. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto the nations, and then shall the end come. Matthew 24, 14. Have you written the reference? Yes, what more? Nothing more, said Simpson. The reporter lowered his pencil and said, Do you mean to say that you believe that when the gospel is preached to all nations, Jesus will return? Just that, said Simpson. The reporter then said, I see the motivation and the motive power in this movement. Now, not every nation, not every heart, not every home will happily receive the gospel. But every nation will have the opportunity, we pray, to hear the gospel. We see the preaching of the gospel is uniquely tied to the coming of Christ. As Jesus is preparing to send to his father, the disciples asked him a question about the kingdom of Israel. Will you now restore the kingdom of Israel? Will you now sit on the throne and rule over Israel and kick all those Romans out and punish all the evil? <laughs> and it's interesting, Jesus doesn't, doesn't say, well, no, not, that's not today, or that will not happen. Or, you know, he doesn't, like really discuss the question. He basically says, we're going to leave it up to the Father. It's interesting, he says, it's not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. It's interesting, it's like God has this calendar up in heaven. Wouldn't you like to see that calendar? This is when things will happen. <laughs> I'd like to see that calendar. <laughs> Father will accomplish what he wants, when he wants, and we'll leave that up to him. But instead of focusing on questions of the kingdom of Israel, let me tell you about the kingdom of God. Christ then commissioned his disciples, go and preach the good news. But the, he really told them to do one thing. He didn't say go preach. He says receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, then you will preach. He told them one thing, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. And when you do, you will be a threat to this evil age. You will do damage to the kingdom of hell. And you will preach the message of Jesus. Christ commissioned them. Receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give them all they need to do that God is asking them. You will start here in Jerusalem. You will go to Samaria. You go to Judea. And you'll go to all over the world and preach the message. Jesus is alive. He's forgiven you of your sins. He's saving you. And he's coming again. When you are filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, you will be compelled to preach the gospel so all the world can hear the message. In Acts 1.8, the Lord Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. You will testify on me. In John, we read this in John 15. When the Helper comes, whom I send to you from the Father, that, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, 
He will testify about me. He will testify of Christ. The Holy Spirit will compel us to speak of Christ. The Holy Spirit will testify of Christ to you as you speak his testimony to others. It will be his words speaking through you. Please, Holy Spirit, speak through me. (laughs) As Christ calls us to tell the world of who he is, we will actually bring hope and peace to this sin-filled world. From Jerusalem to the ends of the world, the gospel must be heard. What can we do as a body here in Evanston to bring the gospel to all the world? You know, it's a lot of times in our Bible study on Wednesday, what is the will of God, you know? What should we do? Now, if you read First John, it's pretty plain, you know. He repeats it over and over, doesn't he, Scott? Like, oh, they love one another. I mean, he just says it over and over. It's like, just say it once. No, 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 no. Over and over, love one another. He's like, you got to beat in your head, you know. <laughs> love one another. But the issue, interesting, when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain of transfiguration, God spoke. And what did he say? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Wow, I wonder what the will of God is. Oh, listen to Christ. Pay attention to what he says. Oh, that makes sense. It's not a mystery. What is the will of God? Pay attention to him. You know, we get caught up in our culture and all the problems, you know, let me, uh, and in politics. And, you know, if every person that I want elected wins and they govern as I want them to govern, you know what? It would not make a dent in the unrighteous actions of humanity and bring no salvation, no forgiveness to any person. Instead, if I obey God, love one another, preach the gospel, feed the hungry, visit the prisoners, care for the widows, clothe the naked, and heal the sick, all in the power of the Holy Spirit, I will do far greater damage to the kingdom of hell than any elected office will do. And as we do, we will celebrate our Lord. We will exalt him. We'll glorify him. And we will pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Number three, the promised coming. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and the cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside him. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. After the Lord Jesus commissioned his disciples, he ascended to his father where he sits at the right hand side of the father. Every disciple is looking up intently into the sky, watching, seeing if they could just catch a glimpse. Maybe, oh, is that him? And they're looking at every aspect of every inch of the sky where he was. And then suddenly two men, angels in white clothing, stood beside them. Our lifestyle is not founded on us looking up into the sky to await his return, but a lifestyle living out his will and doing as he called us. We are to live out our calling, live out his character and his love. Then the two angels again, they said to him, Man of Galilee, why are you standing here looking into the sky? This Jesus who's been taken up from you into heaven, he will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. And, you know, this verse tells us three things about that about Christ's return. Number one, Christ will return. He says he will return. The two men testify that Christ will come again. This is a fact. Let us not doubt or become like those in Second Peter who said, know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Where is he coming? Where's the promise of his coming? He's not coming again. It's been 2,000 years. I don't think he's coming back. You know, that's, that's the temptation. It's the temptation of this world. It's what culture says. Where is the coming of Christ? We see evil exalt its ugly head and it appears to be getting stronger and stronger and more popular. We see immorality exalted and celebrated instead of challenged and reviled. In 1 John we read, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Of course it's going to go in the direction of evil evil then. But we will not entertain doubt but believe in his word and believe in his promise. 
His coming is real, and his coming will overcome the power of the evil one. Although the direction of the world is immoral, Christ through you and me will bring hope and hurting to the, and life to the dying. Because we know when, as evil rears its ugly head, people struggle. They're dying. They're addicted. They're hurt. They're broken. And we come in and say, let me show you a more excellent way. And that is why we cry out, come, Lord Jesus. Number two, Christ's return is, will be visible, is visible. The two men said he will return the same as he left. He left visibly, he'll return visibly. In Revelation, we read, Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. There will be no doubt of his coming. He is not coming secretly, but visibly and loudly. It will be proclaimed, the trumpet will sound, there will be no mistake. His coming will happen, and all those who do not belong to him will see it. And those who do belong to him will be coming with him as he returns. And we cry out, Come, Lord Jesus. And number three, Christ's return is personal. He's coming for you and me. He's coming because he, was, he, he wants you to be with him. He desires for you to be with him. He desires for you to live with him. In Hebrews 9, it says, So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Are we eagerly awaiting him? In Titus we read, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possessions, zealous for good works. Christ's return is personal because we know him and he knows us. We await him. We desire to be near him. His, we desire his presence. It is personal because he's coming for you and to shower his love over you that we may live with him. As a result, I challenge us to live the second coming lifestyle. And so on the back of your insert, which some of you put away too soon, This is how we are to live in expectation of Christ's returning. We are to live holy lives anticipating his return. We are to eagerly await Christ's return, Philippians 3. We are to be faithful unto the end, not giving up, Matthew 24. We are to live serving one another, Matthew 25, 40. We are to ready ourselves in purity, 1 John 3, 3. We are to encourage each other with the coming of Christ, 1 Thessalonians 4.18. We are to live knowing the end and finding strength in Christ, John 16. We are to expect the gospel to be preached to the whole world and for God to use us in doing that. We are to expect to receive a new body, praise God. We should, we'll see the end of death and the end of suffering. We are to live knowing we will suffer, but we will overcome it through Christ's return. We are expected to toil to present everyone perfect in Christ, Colossians 1. Let us live the second coming lifestyle, and declare, come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us, that you're with us to the very end of the age. And as we await your coming, Lord, help us to be faithful in loving others, in loving each other, in serving in love, free to love, and live in love. Help us to know you and to desire you. Come, Lord Jesus.